Hello, welcome back to Dinosaurs. We're going to keep going through Module 2, which is all about dinosaur evolution and behavior. We've talked a lot about the evolution part. Today, we're going to start getting into the behavior part. We're going to talk about functional morphology, which is a way that we're able to analyze dinosaur behavior, even though we're usually only left with the hard part remains to examine. So what can we look at on the skeletal remains that are left behind to try to kind of piece together behavior in life. But before we do that, some announcements. OK, so let's review what we did last time. So uh, this dinosaur would be classified as uh, what? So take a look at the different categories there. Think back to the dino classification in the lecture. What were the big diagnostic characteristics? Uh, you can probably tell based on what's being highlighted in the picture there. Uh, so this is a saurischian dinosaur. So the pubis is facing uh, forward. This is a saurischian configuration. Uh, what about this one? Well, if the other one was a saurischian, and this is different, uh, this is an ornithischian, and the pubis has been rotated around to face backwards. Uh, why? Again, probably to accommodate the large gut of these mostly herbivorous ornithischian dinosaurs. Remember that uh, Rawasukians are not dinosaurs, uh, so they're not on this tree here. Um, they're not on this split. So, and then also carnivores, uh, most ornithischians with the backward facing pubis are actually herbivores. And uh, a lot of the saurischians, we'll talk about sauropods though. Uh, they're not. So let's talk about functional morphology. So uh, today's whole lecture is on functional morphology. Uh, what is that? So functional is kind of like what something use, is used for. What's its function? And morphology is shape. So functional morphology is just the relationship between the shape of something, the morphology, and its use. So there's this idea uh, that basically enables the whole study of functional morphology that form follows function. The shape of something is related to its use. Uh, so a good example here are wing shapes in birds. Uh, a lot of the examples that I'm going to be using today are from live living extant animals, not extinct animals like dinosaurs. Uh, why? Because we're able to kind of make these rules by looking at the shape of modern animals and then looking at their behaviors and making some kind of correlations and rules between like how exactly form follows function. Uh, and then we can use some of those rules that we've established to kind of look at extinct organisms using again that kind of principle like the present is the key to the past. Uh, things, traits that we see in modern herbivores, we would predict that we probably would see them in extinct herbivores. So what are those traits and how can we tell them apart? Uh, so again, looking at the wings here, uh, you can look at just a bird's wing and it tells you something about how they generally behave. So there's like the active soaring wings of like say an albatross, uh, they're flying over water for long periods of time. They're really long and really narrow. They're like gliders. Uh, and then there's kind of the high speed wings more like for falcons where they're really optimized for sustained speed. They're actively hunting on the wing and you need a very different wing to accommodate that. An albatross isn't gonna be able to turn sharply or maintain high speeds in flight, but these other wings allow that. Um, so that's kind of form following function. The function of the wing is determined by kind of what it's used for and, and kind of also vice versa. So there's kind of an argument, uh, does form follow function or does function follow form, kind of which came first, the chicken or the egg. But um, we know that there's a relationship between certain shapes and certain behaviors and that's functional morphology. So what are some examples? Uh, so there's this uh, law of correlation of parts, which says that the link between multiple features of an organism is dependent on their lifestyle. So if we look at modern examples of animals, hoofed animals, animals that have hooves, also tend to have grinding herbivorous teeth. So being hooved is related to being an herbivore. Uh, having sharp, sharp teeth and sharp claws is related to being a carnivore. 
So if we look at modern animals, we can make predictions on extinct animals. If we see a sharp toothed, sharp clawed extinct organism, we can be like, ah, well, that was probably a carnivore or at the very least a scavenger feeding on meat. If we see something that has something that sort of resembles hooves and has kind of more blunt grinding teeth, then ah, well, that was probably an herbivore. Uh, so just a, a kind of funny uh, illustration of this is there's this old story that illustrates this point where allegedly the devil came to visit Cuvier, a famous biologist as he was sleeping, and the devil said, I'm going to eat you alive. Obviously, this probably didn't happen. <laughs> uh, and Cuvier responded, uh, you have horns and you have hooves. You eat plants. You are an herbivore. Law of correlation of parts. The devil has horns and hooves. Think of like cows, goats, sheep. These are the animals that that occurs in. It's not a carnivorous feature. And so he allegedly wasn't scared. Now, obviously, that doesn't happen. But uh, it illustrates the point that uh, you can look at an animal's certain features and make judgments about its lifestyle. So for example, uh, figuring out the diet from the jaw morphology. So if you look at an animal's jaw, uh, you can infer what it ate. So like uh, it, for T-Rex, for example, if we want to know what T-Rex ate, uh, it's impossible essentially to find preserved stomach contents in dinosaurs, there's very, very rare evidence of some stomach contents preserved. So like, for example, that notosaur mummy, that incredibly well-preserved, like once in a lifetime discovery, had stomach contents preserved that we could analyze. Uh, that's one way of getting to diet, but it's, it's incredibly rare. And so while it's incredibly useful, it's probably not something that we can rely on. Uh, and then uh, feces is another way, coprolites, fossilized feces is another way that we can get to diet because pieces of what they eat ends up in their leavings. Uh, and we definitely see fossilized dinosaur coprolites and we're able to examine what the lever was eating. Uh, it's very hard in some cases though to make a distinct, like uh, they always say the, the poopatrator, it's hard to find the poopatrator, uh, which dinosaur actually left that coprolite. Uh, in cases of like T-Rex, the very large leavings of, a, of some carnivorous dinosaur uh, is pretty easy because there's only one carnivorous dinosaur that size that could make that. Um, so it's, it's tricky. However, if we look at the shape of the hard parts, so if we look at the structure of the jaw, the structure of the teeth, uh, we can find some indicators they're likely function. So like carnivor carnivores tend to have scissor style jaws where the pivot is in line with the blades of the jaw and it opens and closes and slashes like scissor blades. Uh, herbivores tend to have this kind of lower pivot point. And so the teeth kind of, instead of kind of scissoring past each other, they're more kind of meeting directly and crushing. And these are the quote unquote nutcracker style jaws used for crushing plant material and grinding and just chewing up uh, really resistant uh, foliage and vegetation. So again, like carnivorous adaptation, they tend to have uh, no ramus. So the jaw kind of pivots right on the pivot here like scissors. This ramus is kind of this downward extension that makes it sort of more of like an up and down crushing motion versus a side to side slashing scissoring motion. And so we can tell diet from these hard parts. Uh, another thing that we can look at is dentition. So teeth, uh, there are multiple things on animals' teeth that we can use to try to figure out what their diet is. So like sharp, uh, pointy, serrated teeth are very typical of a carnivorous diet, whereas blunted teeth, so think of like cows, uh, blunted teeth are usually for herbivory, cr crushing and grinding plants. Uh, we can also look at the location where uh, and the degree of tooth wear uh, to kind of point to a specific diet. So like uh, grasses tend to wear down teeth uh, pretty well and especially in the molars versus if you're actively attacking and grabbing prey, a lot of the wear is going to be up on kind of the more frontal teeth where you're actually biting in to the animal. So looking at just the, the shape of the teeth, the distribution of the teeth, the specialization of the teeth, the different shapes that are around and where the teeth are wearing and the style of the teeth, you can really start to get to 
identifiers of their diet. So like, uh, again, carnivores have sharp teeth, kind of look like this. Herbivores might have sharp teeth in the front for kind of breaking off leaves, but they have this battery of molars in the back or in their cheeks for really kind of chewing that stuff apart. Uh, humans have kind of both features because we, we are omnivorous. We, we are adapted to eat both meat and plant material, nuts, fruits, vegetables, uh, whatever we can happen upon. One of our evolutionary advantages is that we can take advantage of a lot of different opportunities that come our way. We're not very restricted dietarily. We're quite adapted to different, in, uh, different diets. Uh, so let's talk about uh, morphospace. So again, functional morphology is looking at the relationship between form and function. And what we see from analyzing the fossil record is that uh, not all forms are even possible and not all forms are occupied. Uh, so this idea of morphospace, uh, and this is a relatively simple example because like morphospace of dinosaurs is, is much more complex, but this is just uh, coiled shells. So coiled shells of gastropod snails, cephalopods like squids and nautiluses, uh, bivalves like clams and brachiopods, which are these things that are sort of resembling bivalves, but are their own different thing. But um, there's three different axes on this diagram. X is the movement of the spiral of the shell down the axis of the shell. Y is the expansion rate away from the opening. And Z is the distance of that opening from the axis. And so they kind of plotted up in 3D space here and kind of separated into helicoidal forms where it's making like a helix, planispiral forms where it's rotating in a plane around the spiral, uh, and then some different forms where it's actually translating as it grows. And so we see that there's all these different shapes available, uh, but what we end up seeing in the fossil record is that not all of them are used. Uh, so of the total available morphospace, not all of the possible shapes are used. And if they are, they're rare. So for example, uh, here's a plot of expansion rate versus the distance of the aperture from an axis. So now instead of a 3D plot, we have only a 2D plot. And you can see how the shapes would vary. So this shape here is a really high distance from the aperture with a really high expansion rate. And what you end up getting is a spiral that is not closed. It's the chambers are not kind of touching each other. Uh, this is a morphospace that's generally unoccupied. Why? Well, if you look at it, it's not very strong. The chambers are not supporting each other. And so it's very easy for this shell to break. Uh, one of the very few representatives that has a shell like this is spirula, a kind of squid. Uh, and how it does it is that the shell is actually internal to its body. And so it's, it's kind of OK. It doesn't produce as much drag as it would otherwise, and it's not quite as vulnerable as it would be otherwise. But this general opening here, where the organism coils, but the coils are not supporting each other, most organisms don't do that. That's a gap in the morphospace. Uh, Nautilus is another kind of exception where it has an abnormally high expansion rate for the distance. And again, why would you not do that? These shells tend to be relatively fragile. Uh, relatively thin-walled, and so Nautilus is probably occupying sort of the uh, kind of threshold of where that starts becoming a uh, disadvantage. Uh, and so if we start looking at like dinosaur morphospace, uh, what shapes of dinosaurs are available? Dinosaur body plans are somewhat limited, so what, what is advantage? What is a disadvantage? What space can they in theory occupy? And then what space do they actually end up occupying? So uh, there's this idea, this concept of adaptive landscape. And it's a representation of the, the fitness. So again, going back to survival of the fittest. And remember, fittest means best fit to the environment, best fit to their role, best fit to their niche, not bigger, stronger, faster necessarily. Fitness is defined as their fit to their environment. And so the adaptive landscape is a representation of the population's fitness uh, in response to the environment. So there's certain designs, certain shapes that are really good for the environment. They are high fitness. And there's certain other shapes 
that are low fitness. So going back to the uh, coiled shell examples, those unsupported shell chambers that are relatively fragile and really increase water resistance, those would be low fitness. And so the organism would have to actively overcome that. They would have to overcome the fact that that function is not, that form is not ideal. Uh, and then some of the other function features, those shapes are more ideal. And so they're high fitness. Uh, one thing we see though, is that at a given place and a given time, the environment might favor one part of the morphospace, one shape and size uh, over another. And so there's kind of this idea that as the environment changes, this adaptive peak moves and organisms sort of try to evolve their traits more towards the ideal form and the ones that don't die out. Uh, or there's the idea of the static landscape where there's a couple different forms that are good, that are fit, and organisms will adapt towards uh, one or more of those forms over time, and it doesn't really change too much. Uh, but basically, once you're way up on one of these peaks, you've kind of committed to being there, and it's very difficult to kind of go back down and, and make an entirely different shape. Um, so this is adaptive landscape. Again, it's just the concept that uh, organisms have different shapes. There's different shapes that are available to them. Uh, there's certain shapes that they could evolve towards. And in that space, some of them are better than others. Some of them are more fit to the environment than others. Uh, and so um, again, what we see is that the total range of possible shapes, the disparity is much lower than the total number of taxa, the diversity. So there is way more possible shapes than shapes that we actually see. So again, think about using dinosaur as an example. We saw all the different dinosaur shapes that are available, and there's quite a lot of diversity there, but that doesn't represent all of the possible dinosaur shapes. Uh, so why not? Why is there a disagreement between all the possible shapes and the shapes that they've sort of moved towards and adapted to? Well, again, there are certain shapes that are fitter than others, certain shapes that are better than others for the environment. And those are the shapes that they've converged on. Uh, the traditional view of this disparity over time is that disparity, the, the, the total possible shape ranges has kind of increased over time as diversity has increased over time. Uh, the inverted model, which is a relatively recent proposal is that early on in the history of life, there were all of these radically different body plans. And then we kind of got locked in during the Cambrian explosion. And then animals went forward with a very limited uh, array of different body plans available to them. This is the one that I sort of favor because again, if you look back at, and we talked about this a little bit earlier, if you look back at Cambrian organisms, pre-Cambrian organisms, there's a lot of experimental body plans, body plans that are very radically different from things that we actually see surviving to today. If you look at all the animals today, uh, while there is a great diversity, there are a certain body plans that are really kind of locked in. If you look at animals on the land, vertebrates on the land, uh, sure, they look very different from each other, but we're all kind of locked into that four-limbed tetrapod body plan. There aren't many eight-legged vertebrate animals. Now, obviously, spiders are eight-legged, uh, but they're a different group. So the mammals, the reptiles, the amphibians, the vertebrates, we're very much locked in on that four-limb body plan, and we're not able to develop into an eight-limb body plan, even if it would be better. Um, and then there's another example here where just kind of like early high levels of disparity, and that's sort of maintained out to now, where animals would still have the plasticity to kind of move back and forth. Um, so why would we use functional morphology? Uh, one cool thing, one cool way of doing it is uh, if we plot up relevant features of modern animals, uh, we can kind of start clustering them. So these are plots of uh, animals in the Serengeti, in Malaysia, in Yellowstone, uh, in Ch 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 <laughs> not, I probably should have looked at what that is, uh, and I, I can't read that either, but different environments. Um, the x-axis here is hand ratios, 
So a like length versus width of the, the hands, length versus width of the feet, uh, and then length versus width, or, or the, like the, the body weight. So higher body weight, lower body weight. And then we can kind of plot these things up in three-dimensional space. And what you see is that there's certain clusters uh, that form. <clears throat> so in the Serengeti, you have sort of this cluster here, uh, a similar cluster in Yellowstone, but there's a cluster over here that's not filled in, in the Serengeti. So uh, certain niches, certain roles in the environment are favored by certain morphology. And so looking at these, we start seeing different kind of jobs that organisms might fill. So there is, we can cluster out these as arboreal. So like tree dwellers have very different hand, foot, body weight ratios than terrestrial animals versus burrowing animals versus carnivores versus herbivores. Uh, and then like, for example, uh, saber-toothed cats and hyena don, uh, their ratios that are measured from the fossil record, there are no modern animals that have those ratios. So whatever niche they were filling uh, isn't really present in the modern environment, which kind of makes it difficult to uh, examine what particularly that was. So their, their ratios are different than lions. So we might say that saber-toothed cats and lions filled a very similar role, but uh, their morphologies are different. And so is that actually true? So again, this present is the key to the past. Present is the key to the past. If we know what traits are present in which organisms today, we can figure that out from the fossil record. Uh, for that to be true though, for this functional morphology idea to be true, then all traits have to be being acted upon by natural selection at all times. So uh, form follows function is only true if organisms are actually adapted for their optimal function. So like uh, pachycephalosaurs, uh, is their head ornamentation here ideally suited to its function? Or do organisms remain somewhat imperfect? And so uh, does every trait that's present in an animal uh, require a functional explanation? If we see a long trunk on elephants, uh, do we need to explain why they, what they use that for? Or could it just be coincidence of evolution? And with elephants, we have the luxury of looking at them and observing them and seeing that, oh, they actually do use this trunk for grasping as snorkels uh, and for you know, moving water into their mouths. They don't actually use it to siphon up water, but they use the spray into their water. So um, this is sort of limitations of, pans of, of functional morphology is, are all of the features that we see being selected on? Is a triceratops frill present because that's the ideal form for that organism or is there some other explanation for it? Uh, do pachycephalosaurs have these weird skull caps because that's the ideal form or is it something else? Uh, do birds of paradise have those really long elaborate feathers because that helps them survive or is it actually a limitation and there's some other explanation for it? Uh, so what are some limits to functional morphology? What are some issues that we might run into? Uh, some parts of the morphospace remain unoccupied because they just don't work. There are certain shell geometries, as we saw earlier, that just don't work very well, and so they're not going to be present. Uh, there are some unoccupied dinosaur shapes that are not present because they just don't work that well. Uh, so like, for example, if you're going to be an herbivore and you need to carry around a really large gut for digesting plants, being a really long-limbed, delicate, slender build is not ideal. You're going to crush under your own weight. So that morphospace of a delicate, fragile, built herbivore doesn't really exist because it doesn't work. Uh, so another limitation is like, so insects, uh, we often see in horror movies like insects that grow to like colossal sizes. That doesn't work because when they would molt their hard exoskeleton, they would literally collapse into goo under their own weight. Uh, hexagonal eye lenses and honeycombs share a hexagonal pattern because they're the most efficient packing strategy. This is a structural constraint. Uh, they have to be an efficient packing strategy. There's only so many different forms that that works as. 
So not all shapes work, not all shapes are available, and so not all shapes are present and not all shapes are used. Uh, another limit is evolutionary heritage. So an organism has uh, only so many different forms that it has to work with. So for example, we are tetrapods with our four limbs and five digits, pentadactyl five digits. Why? Because when Tiktaalik crawled up on the land, it had four limbs and five digits. All of the terrestrial tetrapods inherited that from Tiktaalik. Modern mammals have four limbs because their ancestors had four fins, uh, not because it's ideal. Uh, it may in fact be the best way to make a running animal or an herbivorous plodding tank-like animal. But the reason we have four limbs isn't because it's the best, it's because it's what's what happened. It's what our ancestors had. Uh, in fact, in many ways, four limbs is not the best for running. Ostriches are quite good at running on two legs. Uh, insects like six legs, spiders with eight legs, millipedes with lots of legs, uh, they move around very efficiently as well. So again, form follows function. Are ostriches bipedal on two legs because it's the most efficient form or is that what their ancestors looked like? Uh, are we bipedal? because that's the ideal form. Well, ideally it frees up our hands to do things, uh, but we're restricted and we're not gonna grow six legs. It's not gonna be something that we're capable of doing. Uh, there's also some other limits called uh, pleiotropy. Uh, so the expression of some features is linked to the expression of other features. The best example of this is that in humans, our thumbs, and our big toes are linked together. Uh, if you change the gene to make your big toe smaller, your thumb is going to get smaller too. They're so linked together in our genetic code. Uh, and in fact, if someone loses a thumb, uh, you can actually transplant a big toe uh, and it works just fine. They're so similar and they fill very similar roles that they can be even interchanged it's a lot easier to go through life without a big toe than it is without a thumb for opposable grasping. And so in some cases, that's what they do. Uh, however, uh, having a long thumb helps us with grabbing things and manipulating things. So having a long thumb is better. Uh, having a longer big toe would make us trip up a lot more, make us less efficient walkers, much less efficient runners. So having a longer big toe is not evolutionarily advantaged. So again, when we think of functional morphology, uh, why is our thumb the size it is when being longer would be an advantage? Uh, there is kind of a trade-off. If we wanna make our thumbs better, we're gonna make our big toes worse. And so this might be a limit of functional morphology. We may not know that. Like why did humans have poorly developed thumbs? Well, we don't, in the fossil record, we might not recognize that restriction and that trade-off. Uh, another limit is that certain characteristics are just neutral. Uh, some features seem to be just leftovers from other changes and they just kind of remain around. So uh, the best example of this, or at least most known, is our chin. So modern humans have a chin that kind of sticks out more so than our ancient ancestors that have a chin that sort of slopes backwards. Uh, there's also like the brow that sticks out uh, and we have kind of the smooth forehead, some smoother and bigger than others. <clears throat> uh, if we assign significance to the chin and be like, hmm, what does that chin do? Why is that chin there? What evolutionary advantage of the chin is there? Uh, we might be wrong because apparently human chins are just there. The chin itself is a result of changes in the teeth that are evolutionarily advantaged. Uh, not change in the chin itself, although there was some speculation that chins like deflect blows or something like that. Uh, I, I don't personally feel like that's all that advantageous because it still hurts. Um, but anyway, uh, a lot of characters that we might assign significance to actually don't have significance to, and they're just relics of other changes. Uh, another limitation that we might see is that a lot of features that are retained by animals are not ideally suited to what we use them for. 
So again, there's this idea that like organisms have a limited amount of shapes and sizes uh, and they work with what they have to solve the problems. So like, for example, a panda thumb, uh, pandas, if you count, so again, pandas are mammals, they're tetrapods, the four limbs, they're also pentadactyl, they should have five fingers. So let's count one, two, three, four, five, six, six. Uh, the panda's thumb is actually a modified hand bone that's been modified out to kind of give them a very bad opposable thumb. Having a longer thumb would be better. It would work quite a lot better, but uh, that's not something that pandas have. Uh, and so having this small little thumb nub that's actually a modified hand bone is better than nothing. They're able to grasp bamboo with it so that they can chew on the leaves and chew on the stalks, uh, but it's not as good as it would be otherwise. Uh, the panda the thumb is not ideal. It's not perfect. It's very imperfect and pandas would be much more beneficial to have a, a full-on functional grasping opposable thumb, but they just don't. It's not ideally developed. And so one thing that this argues against is the intelligent design paradigm. So like this idea that all animals are perfect and how could this perfection of design arise from a perfect, how, how could this uh, perfect design from a perfect creator um, what we see is that a lot of our designs are not perfect. So why do humans have appendixes? Why do, why do snakes and why do cetaceans have vestigial pelvises? Why do pandas have this wimpy little thumb instead of a much better thumb for grasping with? These are vestiges of our ancestry, kind of evidence that evolution is not perfect. There's not an intelligent design there's not a perfect end goal in mind because we're not perfectly designed. We're very well designed and we function in our environments, but there are a lot of ways that our forms are not perfect and not adequately modified for the environment that we're, that we're um, working, that we live in. And that's one of the things that natural selection acts on is if a feature happens to arise that's better, over time, the organism should converge on that feature. Uh, another problem, again, with functional morphology is that sometimes form does not follow function. So some organisms have no clues to their behavior in their morphology, uh, and some other have blatantly misleading clues to their behavior. So an example of the last kind is that, is so like iguanas, marine iguanas are really, really comfortable in the water. They're great swimmers and they spend a lot of time in the sea, but they have no external features that would indicate that. Uh, their tails are a little bit flattened, but their toes you see are not webbed. Uh, they're not, they don't have gills. They, they do not have a lot of features that if you saw only the iguana's skeleton, only the hard parts that are likely to be preserved, you wouldn't think, oh, well, this is definitely an organism that spends a lot of time in the water. We can tell by these specific adaptations, these specific features, uh, there are very few, if any, features that would point out to this is an aquatic organism. Uh, a misleading one is like this green woodpecker. The green woodpecker has a lot of the other features that woodpecking woodpeckers have. It has the sharp pointy beak. It has the crumple zone brain to absorb the impact. Uh, but in general, uh, it doesn't use the long beak to poke wood and it doesn't use the long tongue to probe into the holes that it's making. Uh, it uses the, to kind of slurp up ants and stuff from the ground. Uh, so this woodpecker doesn't actually peck wood. If we found a skeleton of this woodpecker, we'd be like, ah, this woodpecker has the standard woodpecking uh, arsenal. Uh, it must be pecking wood as its lifestyle. And in general, what we see in the living animal is that it doesn't. Uh, without the luxury of observing its behavior, we wouldn't know that. And so we can be wrong in some cases, looking at the fossil record and making these, these guesses, these inferences. Uh, some other limitations are that a lot of features have more than one use. So like uh, if you think about a players, if you've ever been in a pinch camping or something and all you have is a Leatherman, one of those multi-tools, it's basically players with some other 
subpar tools on there, uh, you're going to get creative with it pretty quickly. Or if you're too lazy to walk across the room to grab your toolbox, uh, you might start using the pliers as a hammer. Doesn't necessarily have to be for plying. Doesn't necessarily have to be for pulling stuff. Uh, you can use it to smash things too. Um, a good example of this are bird's wings. So the obvious is that yes, bird's wings are evolved for flight and they use them for flight and that's their primary purpose, but they also use them to shelter their nests and keep the nests warm. Uh, they also use it to flap out and make a defensive posture like look how big I am, I'm coming at you, you better be scared. Uh, they also use it for courtship displays. So especially like the birds of paradise with their big flashy uh, dance numbers, flashing all their brightly colored plumage and dancing around. Uh, they're not just using their wings for flight, they're using them for display too. And so the wings have a lot of different features. Uh, and again, if we look at just the fossil record, uh, we might not know that. If we look at birds in the fossil record, we're like, yeah, those are wings. Birds use wings for flight. Uh, what else do they use wings for? Again, it gets back to the argument, what good is half of a wing? Well, for flight, maybe not much. For protecting your nest and keeping it warm, quite a lot. For defensive posturing, making yourself look bigger, half a wing with a lot of feathers is pretty good at that. Uh, for courtship displays, uh, it's a matter of personal taste, but uh, there's probably ways that their plumage was more attractive than before. <clears throat> uh, so with all these limits in mind, uh, how do we end up studying morphology? Uh, how do we study morphology in the fossil record? Well, one way is, again, looking at living analogs. So we look for similar living organisms. Uh, doesn't really get around a lot of these limitations, so we're just kind of stuck with those. Uh, but if you look at, if you're wondering how does a T-Rex walk, a pretty good analog is uh, an ostrich. Again, birds are descendants from the theropod dinosaurs. Tyrannosaurus rex is a theropod dinosaur. They're very closely related to each other. You see a lot of very similarities in their structures. The legs are, the back legs are built pretty similar. The front legs are built pretty similar, reduced. Uh, the gait is pretty similar, bipedal. The bot center body mass is above the hips, not out in front. Uh, very similar. So if you want to know how T. rex walked, you look at living organisms that are probably close. Uh, if you want to know about large herbivorous dinosaurs with elongated necks, let's go look at large herbivorous animals that are modern with elongated necks, like a giraffe, for example. Uh, or there's experimental analogs. If we want to, we just want to know how it works, we build it. If you want to know how this is an example of an ancient sponge, an archaeocyathid, uh, if we want to know how well this thing filtered, uh, we build some models and we filter with it. Uh, so what are some examples from the fossil record? Uh, we talked about this a little bit. And again, pterosaurs are not dinosaurs, but they're still cool. So let's talk about it. Uh, there was a lot of debate about, well, I mean, there still is, but uh, there's a lot of debate about whether certain pterosaurs, uh, especially the larger ones like Quetzalcoatlus, um, can they actually fly? Can they get off the ground? Um, how do we know that they could fly? Well, you, you build a glider pterosaur. So take the proportions, the structures that we see in the fossil record, and you build one, and you toss it and see how it does, or put it in a wind tunnel and see how it does. Uh, and what they discovered here, this group that, that uh, worked on it, <clears throat> pterosaurs had a relatively low horizontal speed, so uh, very pretty poor compared to modern birds as far as like flying forwards quickly. Uh, but they have a really high, I should say really low, uh, sinking speed. And so while they're aloft, they're very good at gliding and they're very good at staying aloft. They're not agile flyers, they're not fast flyers, but they're very good at soaring. So uh, their sinking speed is actually lower than modern sailplanes, modern gliders that are specifically designed to be really good at sailing and gliding and staying aloft. Now you see that sailplanes compromised a little bit to get higher forward velocities. Uh, and so again, there's trade-offs here. Um, but how, how can pterosaurs fly? I don't know. Let's build one. Let's see. <clears throat> 
Uh, and then, the, of course, there's still a lot of debate about the geometry of pterosaur wings, what exactly the shape was, how exactly they connected. Uh, as we find more and more soft part evidence, the membranes preserve, kind of honing in on this a little bit, but there's still some uncertainty. Uh, and then again, those elaborate head crests, uh, what were those head crests for? Uh, are those head crests functional morphology? So are they actually an advantage for flight? Do they provide stability? Do they provide ruddering? Or are they actually a hindrance? And they're just there for, say, sexual display, where they hinder the animal's performance in flight and hunting and finding food and escaping predators, but they make it more likely that it reproduces. That's, a, again, a trade-off. Uh, another example is T-Rex bite force. Uh, we cannot just measure a T-Rex's bite force directly. There's no T-Rexes alive to say, hey, chomp down on this and we'll measure it. Um, we can't measure it directly, but we can reconstruct their musculature and we can use modern analogs to see the bite force. So uh, muscles and ligaments, uh, there are no muscles or ligaments or skin or cartilage or any of the soft parts preserved here, but there are, there are signs on the hard part bones of where ligaments were attached, where muscles were attached. These areas are visible on the hard part. So while the muscles and ligaments themselves are not preserved, we can see where they were attached. And going back to holes in the skulls, uh, those holes are in the skull to provide room for the jaw muscles to come down. If you, you can feel the muscles in your face moving through those holes in your skull to increase your bite force. Uh, how much muscle you have is restricted by the space that's available. The muscles come down through those fenestrae, those holes, those openings in the skull, and it's restricted by how large those openings are. And so we know where T-Rex's muscles attached and we know how much muscle mass there was because it filled the, it evolved to fill that space. And so they would actually build a working simulation of T-Rex's bite. And what they saw was uh, T-Rex had a bite force uh, at the upper end of about 57,000 Newtons. Uh, that's a lot. <laughs> so uh, if we look on the list down here, uh, Great White Shark at 18,000 Newtons, so almost three times as much as a great white shark. Yeah, crocodiles, alligators are pretty high as well. Uh, humans, uh, 533 Newtons, we're not so great. Uh, but uh, even T-Rex, the second highest bite force of all time, uh, pales in comparison to Megalodon. So Megalodon, that big extinct shark, Megalodon literally means large tooth, um, about the size of your hand, some of the bigger teeth. Uh, went extinct about four-ish million years ago, uh, did not live at the same time as dinosaurs, so it's a relatively recent compared, but again, the bite force is just massive, again, from reconstructing the jaw attachments, reconstructing the muscle attachments, uh, and sort of building these models. Uh, another cool example from dinosaurs is hadrosaur sounds. So when you watch things like Jurassic Park or any kind of media that features dinosaurs, uh, what sounds did they make? Uh, we don't really know. Uh, again, look at what's preserved here, the hard parts. Uh, what did a T-Rex sound like? Uh, did a T-Rex kind of roar, make those kind of guttural sounds like a crocodile? Or the alternative, like, well, T-Rexes are, again, uh, theropod dinosaurs. Uh, birds are theropod dinosaurs. Birds make noises that we know and we can measure. Did T-Rex sound like a bird? Uh, instead of honking, instead of roaring, did T-Rex like honk? Uh, maybe, maybe not. So how can we figure that out? Uh, the best example of this is, so hadrosaurs, uh, the duck-billed dinosaurs, uh, a lot of them have this crest on top. So uh, Parasaurus had this crest on top. Uh, initially, it was kind of thought that it might be like a, 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 a snorkel so that they could put their heads underwater and feed on vegetation and still kind of breathe out of the back, but uh, it doesn't work because there's no openings on the top. There's no nostrils up here to work as a snorkel. So it just doesn't work, it's not a snorkel. So what is it? It's hollow, it has an airway tube. Why are they using it? 
um, they built a model of this and they simulated air flowing through it and they got noises. So they actually literally built a dinosaur in a 3D software, uh, flowed air through it, just like we would if we're trying to build like a trumpet or a tuba or something like that. Uh, you can simulate the sounds that are coming come out of it. If you wanna, you can play the video here. Uh, it starts out with some sounds that are not very organic sounding that are a lot more like you know, brass instruments that probably aren't really close to what it was. But uh, as you get further and further along in the video, it gets kind of more uh, bird-like and probably actually close to what these things sounded like. So again, uh, what does a dinosaur sound like? Functional morphology, the shape is related to the function. Uh, let's build it, let's build this dinosaur, let's reconstruct this dinosaur and let's see, let's actually build a model and test it. Uh, and then the last one, oops. Uh, so there's been a lot of debate and we're gonna talk about this a lot when we get to Spinosaurus, Spinosaurus. Uh, the lifestyle of Spinosaurus has been very controversial lately. Uh, there's been a lot of back and forth in paleontology circles about exactly what Spinosaurus did for a living. So uh, you can see it has kind of this elongated snout and these uh, battery of teeth that usually indicates that it's piscivorous, that it eats fish. Uh, we see this a lot in modern piscivores, modern things that eat fish. Uh, so that's probably what Spinosaurus did. Uh, but there's been a big debate about whether Spinosaurus kind of hangs out on the coast, like a very similar to like a heron, and just kind of picks things off. And so it's not actually in the water, it's just near the water. Uh, or if it was very heavily adapted to life in the water, uh, maybe it had webbed feet, maybe it was using the big sail that kind of defines it, Spinosaurus, because it has this big sail on its spine. Uh, was it very used to the water? Was it adapted to the water? Did it swim in the water a lot? Uh, there's this cool website here that I've included a link to called Iceburger. Uh, and you can kind of just draw whatever you want. Uh, and then it actually shows you how it would float if it were an iceberg. Uh, and so there was some modeling done on Spinosaurus, like uh, is it actually uh, an efficient floater? Would it float in the way that modern aquatic animals do? Uh, does it have a lot of the same adaptations that modern aquatic animals do? So was Spinosaurus, Spinosaurus adapted to an aquatic lifestyle or was it kind of more hanging out on the side? Uh, again, we'll talk about this debate when we get to Spinosaurus itself, so I don't want to ruin that. Uh, but these are just some examples of functional morphology, shapes affecting their use case or the use case affecting their shapes. So that's functional morphology. That's it in a nutshell. Uh, that's all we've got time for today. I hope you found that interesting, and goodbye.